Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Barlo Demergerdichen of the Armenian Studies Program. And on behalf of the program, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, which is part of the Armenian Studies Program Spring 2021 Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture is co-sponsored by the Society for Armenian Studies. Uh, all of our events this semester have been on uh, Zoom meeting links uh, through Zoom meetings. And after today's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions using the question and answer area of Zoom. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll be able to find the uh, question and answer uh, area. Actually, you're gonna be using the chat area, I should say, so the chat area, and you can be writing questions. And then at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, we'll allow people to uh, ask some questions and we'll have some, some questions. I wanna start off today by uh, telling you a little bit about some of our upcoming events at the Armenian Studies Program. These are our events coming up in the month of uh, March and uh, April. So I'm gonna just share the screen with you. You can follow us on our website at fresnostate.edu forward slash Armenian studies to find out about all of our upcoming events. You can also follow us on Facebook at Armenian studies Fresno State or on Twitter at Armenian studies FS. I am hosting a radio program called All Things Armenian, which uh, airs every Sunday from two to three o'clock on a radio station called Multicultural 1600 AM. Uh, and then this show is also archived on SoundCloud and you can find it under the name of the show, All Things Armenian. And I interview a variety of people uh, on a variety of topics, including art and literature, history, new books, uh, and some very interesting guests that I've had. Now, next Saturday, which is going to be uh, March the 27th, uh, our guest is going to be Dr. Khachig Muradian. He is the author of a new book called The Resistance Network, The Armenian Genocide and Humanitarianism in Ottoman Syria, 1915 to 1918. That is going to begin at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and you can see the link at the bottom. If you need the link, you can also go to our uh, Facebook or also our uh, website. Dr. Khach uh, Muradian was uh, just recently appointed to the Library of Congress. Uh, he is a graduate of Clark University, and this is his uh, new book based on his doctoral dissertation. Following that, uh, on April the 9th, I'm gonna be giving a talk as part of the Arts in Motion Week, uh, which is the uh, Fresno, State, Fresno State College of Arts and Humanities uh, annual celebration of graduation. And I'll be giving a talk on Armenian art, Armenian architecture, Friday night, April the 9th at 7 p.m. And then in April on Friday, April the 16th at 5.30 p.m., we're going to uh, be discussing a film called The Last Inhabitant. Uh, and the director, Jivan Avatisyan, will be uh, joining us through Zoom. And The Last Inhabitant is a movie uh, based on a um, uh, the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, but taken from a different uh, perspective. And you'll be able to watch the film uh, in the week preceding uh, the discussion, which will take place on Friday, April the 16th. So again, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, on Armenian Studies Fresno State, or you can go to our website, fresnostate.edu, Armenian Studies and you can join us for some of our upcoming events. Our semester does end in uh, May, so it's, uh, we're getting toward the end of our semester. We have a week of break uh, starting March 29th, and then following that, we'll have our last few weeks of, of uh, classes. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Zovinar Derderian. She is currently teaching at the American University of Armenia and she received her doctorate from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her dissertation is entitled, Nation Making and the Language of Colonialism, Voices from Ottoman Vaughan in Armenian Print Media and Handwritten Petitions, 1820s to 1870s. She has co-edited a volume called The Ottoman East in the 19th Century, Societies, Identities and Politics, which was published by I.B. Torres. She currently serves on the editorial board of Etude Armenian Contemporain and is the editor of entries uh, of the Society for Armenian Studies website. Now tonight she's going to speak about the, the topic of migrants from Bonn and the transforming politics of representation in the Ottoman Empire, 1850s to 1870s. She'll be focusing on the role of the Pantuks, the migrants, 
uh, of which there's a lot to be said. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this presentation as well, uh, because this is in a very interesting period in, in history. So I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Zovinar Dederian, to give her presentation. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor Dermagadrichan, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, uh, I would like to take, uh, thank the Armenian uh, Studies Program of Fresno State uh, for hosting me today and also the Society for Armenian Studies uh, for their co-sponsorship of this uh, lecture. Um, and it's great to see some uh, familiar names uh, in, in the list of the uh, participants as well. Uh, so, as uh, Professor Dermagerdi Chan mentioned, today I will speak about uh, Armenian migrants, or better known as uh, Armenian Bandukhts in uh, Constantinople in the mid 19th century. Uh, these migrants had largely come to the Ottoman capital from the eastern provinces of the empire. Late 19th century Armenian narratives often characterized Bandukhts as labor migrants in Istanbul who were poor, miserable, and indigent. Uh, Bandukhts were sometimes also referred to as gharibs, uh, a Turkish word with an Arabic root meaning stranger. Such portrayals of Bandukhts appear in the works. Oh, uh, I guess I have not shared, sorry. Uh, I just realized. Uh, you can see my slides now, right? Yes. Thank you, sorry. Um, so such portrayals of Bandukht appear in the works of famous Armenian author from Iran, uh, Rafi's writings, um, such as in the novel of Gharib Mashadzi, The Stranger from Mush, that was published in 1886. In this novel, Rafi tells a sad story of a labor migrant from Mush uh, the difficulties he faces in Istanbul, his loneliness, and his eventual death uh, from poor health. Bandukht had become a subject uh, in the paintings, photographs, and port postcards of late 19th century Armenian and European artists, uh, as you can see in these uh, paintings um, on the slides. Um, and uh, actually, uh, this uh, visual representation of Bandukhts uh, is discussed in depth in a recent and excellent dissertation uh, by Vasken Davitian, uh, from whose work I've actually uh, borrowed many of these um, uh, photographs and paintings. Uh, one can find different books from this period dedicated to Bandukhts, uh, articles, letters, songs, and poems. Uh, related to Bandukhts would appear in newspapers and uh, periodicals uh, of, uh, our, uh, uh, of the Armenian print in the 19th century. The songs and poems often characterized Bandukhts as melancholic and as people who longed for their fatherland. This sense of melancholy comes alive in a quartet of a song in which the Bandukht addressing the crane, the Garung, says, I have left properties and orchards behind. Every time I say, ah, oh, my heart breaks apart. Oh, crane, wait for a second. Let my soul hear your voice. Oh, crane, don't you have any news from our country? This romantic characterization of labor migrants in their poverty and melancholy render them a sense of innocence, which often also translates to being apolitical. This representation in literary pieces and visual materials ask their audience to sympathize uh, with the migrants, with the Bandukhts, but they only rarely give us glimpses of them as engaging in political activities in the Ottoman capital. Historians thus far have not really considered Bandukhts in Constantinople as people who have any meaningful effect on the political and socio-cultural transformations of the 19th century Ottoman Empire. Rather, it is suggested that they migrated because of the worsening conditions in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Through such migration, they also became a symbol of what was happening in the eastern provinces 
the dire conditions of what was at the time referred to as Armenia or the Patriarch Hyrenic, and what is today referred to as Western Armenia among Armenians. Today, I will largely focus on migrants from Van, um, because that is the region um, that I focused on in, in, in my larger work. Uh, as many of you know, it was located at the far east uh, borderland of the Ottoman Empire. By fo focusing on particular uh, Armenian bandukhs from Van, I tried to unsettle the one-dimensional interpretation of bandukhs by showing that migrants in Istanbul, or at least Vanetsi Bandukhts in Istanbul, were crucial to some of the socio-political transformations that were occurring in the 19th century. Bandukhts were not just objects of paintings, photography, and literature, but they were also active subjects of history. This will be the main point of my talk today. And to argue this, uh, we also have to understand that the word bandukht in the 19th century did not simply refer to labor migrants. Uh, bandukht, more broadly speaking, meant a person who was away uh, from home. So a person as well known as Magartic Kharimian, as you can see in this uh, picture, uh, who was grand and majestic and uh, probably the most famous person of Armenian history in the 19th century, could also be identified and identify himself as a bandukht. As you may know, in 1869, Kharimian became the Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople, and later in the 19th century, he became the Catholicos of Echmiadzin. Yet despite being a powerful figure, uh, Kharimian would often call himself a bandukht when he was in Constantinople, away from his home province of Van. Whether one was a, a, a merchant, a student, a clergyman, or a labor migrant, if the individual traveled away from Van, um, and especially to Istanbul, they would often call themselves bandukht. This is important to keep in mind because bandukhs in Istanbul had networks based on regional ties, regardless of their occupation and socioeconomic background. So it no, would not be very difficult for a merchant or a no, notable from Van to get in touch with labor migrants from Van as fellow bandukhs in the Ottoman capital. In the 19th century, the only way a labor migrant could be distinguished from other types of itinerants was if they were called by their profession, such as in the case of porters uh, who were referred to as hamas in Turkish. Therefore, when the word bandukht appears in historical sources, such as petitions that are uh, the primary uh, type of source that I use, uh, we have to be careful about the multi-layered meaning uh, that the word contained. There are, however, good reasons why uh, there is the impression that the bandukhts were large, largely labor migrants um, and why uh, writers, photographers, and painters of the 19th century often spoke of bandukhts as labor migrants. That is because according to uh, one Ottoman census, labor migrants made up two thirds of the total population of Istanbul in 1857. According to the same census, there were about 18,000 Armenian labor migrants in Istanbul in 1857, who had come from all over the empire. So labor migrants that were not just composed of Armenians, but also Muslims and other religious groups made up a significant portion of uh, the population of the Ottoman capital. My work, however, primarily focuses on Armenian labor migrants and the ones from Van, as I've mentioned, whose increasing presence in Istanbul played a central role in collapsing space and time between Van and the Ottoman capital. Regional ties were very important for Bandukhs, uh, for political mobilization, and there were a number of factors in Istanbul that facilitated the bonding of bandukhs. It wasn't just a feeling of being from a particular province, uh, 
um, that uh, that would connect them, but also being part of the same pr uh, profession. Um, they would often, the bundles from Vaughan would often work um, uh, for shop owners who were from Vaughan. Vaughan Armenians were known for being uh, porters, hamals, uh, but they also worked as bakers, barbers, servants, garbage men, and firemen. While most labor migrants were men, some of them were also women who often worked as washerwomen. And you can see in these paintings in an Armenian um, migrant uh, represented, um, uh, who is uh, actually represented as being from Bonn. Uh, but women uh, do, don't appear on uh, Ottoman censuses um, or the population registers of the mid 19th century. But they do occasionally appear in the petitions that I studied in um, uh, that, that uh, were sent from Van uh, to the Constantinople Armenian Patriarchate. Bandukhs of the same region um, usually tended to stay in the same Han, which is a, a large inn that usually looked like uh, what you see in this uh, picture. Of course, this is a contemporary picture of a Han in, in Istanbul. Um, a lot of the Hans, uh, many of the Hans um, survive uh, to this day. Uh, the Hans were often at some distance from the residences of the local permanent population of Istanbul, and the residents of Hans were exempt from paying taxes in uh, Istanbul, but they were expected to pay taxes in their hometown or home village. Such legal measures enhanced the Bandukh's ties with their home province, as well as the politics uh, 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 of their province, because in the 1850s and 1860s, the notion of voting was being uh, introduced in the Ottoman Empire. This was a time when the Tanzimat reforms uh, had been launched in the Ottoman imperial sen sentence. Uh, some of the main reforms falling under the, the, the Tanzimat aimed to restructure the system of governments of the empire. In this context, the institutions of the Armenian community were being restructured as well. In many ways, the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire was being unified through an emerging centralized administrative system of communal governments that in the Ottoman context is known as the millet system. Starting in the 1840s and 1850s, two separate councils were created that were attached to the Constantinople Patriarchate. They were known as the political council and the spiritual council, which eventually became uh, the religious council. These institutional reformations speak to a secularizing transforma transformation that was underway. By 1860, a committee of Armenian laymen and clergymen in cooperation with the Ottoman state uh, put together the Armenian national constitution that in 1863 was approved by the Sublime Port, which was the central government office uh, in Istanbul. According to the constitution, a national assembly was formed in Istanbul with 140 laymen and 20 clergymen. The Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople was the head of the assembly. Similar assemblies were also created in the provinces. But in my research, I have found that at least uh, in Van and in Erzurum, otherwise known as Garin, such representative uh, national assemblies made up of lay individuals already existed in the 1850s before the coming about uh, uh, the adoption of the national constitution. Men who paid at least 75 hurush a year, um, the monetary value of the time, could vote for representatives in the local and national assemblies. To give an idea of what 75 hurush was, uh, at the time, uh, uh, for example, the newspaper Masis, which is the most um, famous Armenian newspaper in the empire, um, was uh, the uh, its annual fee was a hundred hurush. Uh, however, uh, in the uh, in the eastern province, uh, Erzurum, for example, um, the average household income was two hundred and seventy hurush uh, in the eighteen forties. 
So not every man uh, could vote, uh, could have the right to vote. Furthermore, the Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire were disproportionately represented uh, in the National Assembly in Istanbul. Only 40 out of the 120 lay representatives in Istanbul were actually from the provinces or were actually representing the provinces. Uh, in other words, only one third of them uh, were uh, provincial deputies. Yet the majority of Armenians who lived in the Ottoman Empire lived outside of Istanbul, um, largely in the eastern provinces and elsewhere in the empire. Thus, the Istanbul uh, Armenian population was overrepresented uh, in the Armenian National Assembly. Yet they did, they did make decisions that affected uh, provincial Armenians as well. In this context of a weak representation of voices from the provinces, um, we have to consider the role of Bandurts in Istanbul and the gap that they were, were trying uh, to fill. While there had always been migration and travel to Istanbul, in the 19th century, some technological changes affected the experience of migrants and travelers, as well as the type of activities that Bandurts could engage in. Transport between Istanbul and Van became accelerated because in 1836, the first steamship appeared on the Black Sea, uh, run by a British company that served the Istanbul um, Samsun Trabzon line. So Armenians from Van, instead of uh, going to Istanbul by land, would travel to Trabzon and then um, uh, take the steamship to Istanbul um, in order to travel there. Since the introduction of the steamship uh, on the Black Sea in the mid 1830s, the journey between uh, Van and Istanbul was basically cut in half. Uh, if before the journey could have taken up to seven to eight weeks, uh, after the introduction of the steamship, the journey was down uh, to three weeks. Uh, with the travel uh, time cut in half, not only people could travel faster, but also the connections, uh, the communication between Van and Istanbul uh, would be accelerated as well. Uh, and this communication was um, increased even more because of the, uh, the newspapers and uh, periodicals, uh, the number of which was uh, quickly increasing uh, in the uh, Ottoman Empire in the mid 19th century. And, and I'm mainly talking about um, Armenian language periodicals and newspapers, as well as Armeno Turkish um, language uh, newspapers, that is, um, Armenian uh, or Turkish written in, in the Armenian alphabet. Now, not everyone was literate in the 19th century, obviously, and certainly not all the bandhuks were literate. But there were various oral mediums through which information and uh, new ideas published in newspapers and periodicals would be circulated. Public spaces where Armenians of different socioeconomic strata uh, could meet provided such opportunities. Um, for example, coffee house houses, um, as you see in this picture, uh, served as the space in which regional ties were enhanced as there were provincial coffee houses in Istanbul that would be frequented, frequented by men of the same province. Uh, Ottoman historian Cengiz Kurla's study of Ottoman spy reports on public spaces in Constantinople from the 1840s has demonstrated that migrants would complain about the officials in the provinces, as well as the tax collectors um, in the provinces. Um, so the coffee houses were very much a space where conversations about politics uh, would take place. As I mentioned earlier, most uh, Bandurts lived in Hans, um, as separate as the Hans were from the permanent residents uh, of the city. The variety and multiplicity of transactions that took place in the Han uh, made the residents of the Bandurts very much of a public space. Uh, Hans were spaces of trading and manufacturing. Um, often the residents would live in the, on the second um, uh, floors, uh, while the first floor um, uh, was used for um, 
various type of uh, merchandise, uh, but uh, it, they would also often house um, the publishing houses uh, of newspapers uh, and, and periodicals. Um, and the courtyard, as you can see here, sort of separated from the street, would serve uh, as, as a common space that allowed uh, for greater interaction of the residents, uh, unlike what you may see in the modern day hotel. Uh, one could find stores um, in the first floor of Hans uh, and uh, lodging rooms in the second floor. In the late 1850s, um, when Vartapet Devgans of Van uh, was in Constantinople, he stayed in Tahtkhan or Tahtahan, um, whose Hanji, the head of the Han, uh, was Grigor Gerbashian Aga, um, very likely a, a Van Etsy himself. Uh, in Tahtkhan, the Vartapet from Van stayed in a room along with uh, Mahdesi Abraham uh, and another priest to be um, uh, from Yerevan with whom he had traveled. Their room was right next to the room of some porters from Armenia, uh, which uh, was a term used uh, to identify the Eastern provinces of the empire. Thus, we can see that bandurts of different socioeconomic backgrounds had a chance to interact and build bonds uh, within, uh, uh, with one another in, in Hans. Um, Hans, as I mentioned, uh, often housed uh, newspapers, uh, publishing houses. Sorry, I lost my mouse for some reason. Um, sorry. OK. Um, so uh, for instance, the publication of the newspaper Masis in its early years started in Vezirhan. Uh, and in 1859, according to the great Armenian satirist uh, Hagop Baronian, uh, the Armenian um, periodical uh, Munadi Ergias, or the Herald, Herald of Arjus, uh, used the coffee house in Bezirhan as its editorial office. Uh, the Bandukhts who stayed in Hans uh, would have an immediate access to the newspapers and could access news before it was published. Um, before it was published. The residents of Ahan would also be able to submit letters to newspapers with some ease due to their proximity to the publication uh, centers. Um, access to scribes could also be found in Hans. As you can see in this painting, there is a petitioner who has um, uh, gone to a scribe uh, and they're in the process of um, putting together a petition um, that could either be sent to uh, the Ottoman government or um, um, the patriarchate. Um, Hans did not only serve uh, individual petitioners, but also a place where people could assemble to prepare a collective petition. Um, in a few moments, I will show and talk to you about such collective petitions that express the grievances and demands of vanities. Uh, but as you can see in this uh, painting, uh, the process of reading um, and writing could often be done in presence of, of, of multiple individuals. Thus, the spaces of coffee houses and hands being sociable ones were prone to mobilizing people as they discussed politics, organized to submit collective petitions to the patriarchate or the sublime port, or joined forces to go out on the street in protest uh, of a decision regarding Van. In the margins of Rafi's novel, Gharib Meshetsi, we come across moments when Bandukhts discussed politics uh, in barber shops, wineries, and churchyards. Uh, it is in a barber shop that one of uh, Rafi's characters takes out a thick chunk of paper filled with signature and uh, waves them in front of everyone, asking who else wants to add his signature to this petition. This moment in the novel depicts the importance of a number uh, of the importance of the number of signatures collected uh, for a petition and points to a possible means by which signatures for such petitions 
could have been acquired from Bandurt in the various public spaces of Istanbul. Labor migrants in Rafi's novel knew in which church the good sermons were delivered, pointing to the interest labor migrants had in the content of the sermons delivered um, to them. The preacher would talk not only about religion and piety, but also about politics. According to a newspaper announcement, a decree was read in the Church uh, of Constantinople in 1864 that warned people not to buy and not to read publications that included foreign doctrines and, incite, uh, and included inciting articles. Even for the illiterate, the Sunday sermon would become a place um, for bundles to find out about political conflicts and the contents of newspapers. After the Sunday service, some of the bundles would gather in the adjacent hall of the church to take lessons uh, in reading and writing. In the 1830s, about 18 to 20 young bandurts were studying in the Narcissan school uh, in Haas Square neighborhood of Constantinople, and local benefactors had rented a special house for them. In the 1850s, uh, the school called uh, Surpergij uh, Jemaran played a similar role in providing education for bandurts. Often music lessons or other subjects uh, were provided in Hans um, that uh, the bundles could likely participate to. The various bits of information about educational opportunities for bundles suggest that within their network in Constantinople, there were some who could have had the basic skills of reading and writing. Some bundles would most certainly know how to sign their names, to read a newspaper out loud to their fellow um, labor migrants, or to read out a petition that they were about to submit uh, to a newspaper, to the Patriarchate or to the Ottoman port. Uh, and letters and petitions, as uh, I already said, um, uh, were often read and written uh, in a collective matter, manner and in, not in solitude, as we can see uh, depicted in this painting by Gara Bednashanyan. The presence of uh, bandurts in Istanbul sped up the process of petitioning. While a petition sent from Van could take four to seven weeks uh, to be read by the Patriarchate of Constantinople, uh, the spread of communication uh, through uh, petitions, which was much faster when Van Armenians in Constantinople submitted a petition regarding matters concerning Van. It could take as little as six days for a petition to be processed when they were submitted locally. Beyond the speed of submitting a petition, it was also easier for bandos in Constantinople to find a scribe in the Ottoman capital than it was in Van, due to, due to the larger bureaucracy and educational opportunities that existed in Istanbul. It was also cheaper to submit a petition locally um, as petitioners at least save the cost of uh, transporting the petitions. So petitions uh, also required, like scribes also required uh, money to write the petitions uh, buying a paper, obviously, would also cost some money. Um, so there were different costs uh, related to the submission of petitions. Um, but the conveniences that existed in Istanbul enhanced uh, the significance of bandurts uh, within the uh, um, context of van politics. Uh, the spatial living and occupational uh, organizations and settings of the everyday life of bandurts provided on opportunities for enhanced regional networks as Ottoman legal boundaries, living quarters, occupational ne networks sharpened the sense of regional ties. As mediums of communal gathering, communication, and learning, uh, the spaces set the stage um, for the materialization of collective actions of bandos and the expression of their voices. The depiction of Bandurt's lives in a vibrant setting of communication and sociability allows us to imagine them beyond their menial jobs. 
Beyond the naivety, naivete and poverty which literary works, newspapers, paintings, and books of the 19th century usually ascribed to Bandung. It is through newspapers, petitions, and th um, that bundles in Istanbul uh, um, from Van tried to make their voice heard in the Ottoman capital. The presence of a large number of bundles in Istanbul had become almost like a political card, uh, as I will show in a moment. What Vanatis wanted uh, to raise their voice about often concerned matters dealing with the Catholicos of Ahtamar, the prelate of Van and the abbots of monasteries in the region of Van. These were important ecclesiastic positions as the Catholicos, the prelate and abbot, abbots were not simply spiritual leaders. They first of all were engaged in collecting taxes for their individual monasteries and churches they had the institutional power to determine whose family's daughter uh, would marry whose son. And this was an important source of power to determine how alliances were shaped uh, in the provinces. Um, and it was a means for certain um, and no notables to become more powerful through family alliances. Uh, the church leaders did not always want such alliances to take place as it could mean the weakening of their own power. Uh, the mentioned ecclesiastic could also write uh, petitions on behalf of local Armenian, Armenians to centers of authority, such as the Patriarchate or the Echmiatin Katholikosate in the Russian Empire. Petitioning was an important avenue through which the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire could make their voice heard through two higher authorities. They also could and did petition to the Ottoman government, both uh, locally and uh, to the central government in Istanbul. Armenians could also individually petition to the Patriarchate, directly petition to the Patriarchate, but having the mediation of the local ecclesiastic authority often strengthened their case, as the local prelates often also stood as judges on legal cases that fell within the boundaries of the Armenian community. Armenians could also go to Muslim and later non-religious Ottoman courts, which they did. The prelates acted as the main representative um, of the Armenian community vis-a-vis -vis the local Ottoman state representatives. Uh, these ecclesiastics were often engaged in mediating relations uh, with Kurdish leaders, particularly in, in, in provinces like Van, who until the mid 19th century had significant power in Van as opposed to the Ottoman state, uh, which had a rather weak presence in the peripheral regions of the Ottoman Empire. Until the mid 19th century, the Catholicos of Ahtamar, uh, the prelate in Van, and the abbots of the monasteries were often picked through the mediation of local notables in Van. But in the mid 19th century, as the structure of the Ottoman government and thereby also the Armenian church of the Ottoman empire was changing, the Armenian patriarchate in Constantinople began to be more engaged in the selection of ecclesiastics in Van. Therefore, between the 1840s and the 1870s, Almost every appointment and, and selection of important ecclesiastic positions in Van were highly contested. Different groups uh, were formed supporting one ecclesiastic or one priest over another. Petitions and newspaper articles were written praising one priest and slandering another. The contestation over the seat of Ahtamar even involved the murder of an ecclesiastic of a bishop that I will shortly talk about. Such ecclesiastic conflicts, uh, networks, and politics of the 19th century are brilliantly discussed in the recent book of Richard R. Antaramian, um, which I highly recommend. Uh, although these conflicts uh, within the ecclesiastic system are part of my talk today, what I'm particularly interested in um, is understanding how people of a lower strata, namely the Banduk Zavan, became engaged in these conflicts 
and what their role was in negotiating the changing understanding of whose voice should affect governance and politics. What I find interesting is that those who petitioned to the patriarchate, uh, wrote to newspapers, or the bundles that protested in the streets of Istanbul, usually argued that a particular person had to be the Catholicus of Ahtamar or the prelate of Van, because that was the will of the people. This shows that the idea of popular representation already existed among Vanetis in the mid 19th century. And I find this to be an important discovery because not just Bandos, but also Armenians of the Eastern provinces in general in the 19th century um, it, it had developed this, uh, um, uh, this notion. Yet historians to this day are often po uh, po portray uh, the people of the provinces as not really in touch with modern ideas of the enlightenment, such as popular representations or more secularized notions of political power. But it, that is largely because we tend to examine Armenians of the Eastern provinces through the lens of Istanbul, rather than by hearing the voices of the local population in the Eastern provinces such as in Van. In my work, I particularly focus on handwritten petitions from Van, uh, such as the ones that you can see uh, on the slide now, um, and follow traces of Van uh, in literary works and print media um, to render the voices of Van more audible. Um, Uh, reference to the people or the Azg or Zhogovurt in Armenian of Ahtamar and Van as a collective, as a unit of authority, appeared in handwritten petitions submitted to the Echmiat in Catholicosate and the Constantinople Armenian Patriarchate of the era. Azg, although meaning nation in Armenian, in the 19th century fluctuated between signifying the people of a religious community that was slowly becoming a national one. Ask could sometimes also signify the authority figures and bodies of, ethno, of the ethno-religious community of Armenians. So referring to what the majority of the people wanted uh, had become an important way of putting pressure on political authorities. But petitioners had other ingenious ways of putting pressure on the patriarchate, um, which represented the political authority of the Armenian uh, community. For example, they used the authority of the sublime port to put pressure uh, on the patriarchate. In a petition from 1866, signed with the collective name of the Banduk people of the Diocese of Ahtamar, it's the petition that you see on your screen now. The Catholicos Khachatur Shiroyan, uh, a notorious uh, Catholicos, uh, was being accused of being unlawful and being a murderer. Uh, Catholicos Petros had been murdered in 1864, and the fingers uh, of accusations were being pointed at uh, Catholicos Khachatur as he had taken over the seat of Ahtamar uh, soon after the former uh, Catholicos Petros uh, was murdered. The petitioners specifically emphasized that not only had Khachatur acted against the law of the church, but also against the civil or political law. In particular, they stated that he had obstructed political law by being implicated in a murder. Although the Armenian church would have deemed this murder a sin, the petitioners invoked civil law, meaning the law of the Ottoman state, which should have been used to prosecute the act of a murder. In this pluralistic system of law, the petitioners knew to evoke the different legal and political tools available to them. But it is also interesting that instead of distinguishing between Ottoman and Armenian law, they distinguish between the church law by which they may have uh, meant religious law and political law, thus evoking a new secular understanding of law. 
As such, they called attention to their belonging, not only to the Armenian church, but also to the Ottoman imperial state. They reminded the patriarchate that local, uh, the local government of Van had informed the sublime port of the murder and that the sublime port had in turn uh, informed the patriarchate. As a punishment, the Bandukhs demanded that Khachatur be exiled, Catholicos Khachatur. Uh, they threatened to go to the sublime port and complained that the patriarchate was supporting the murderer. They used the sublime port against the patriarchate, demonstrating their understanding of how much power the sublime port had over the patriarchate. In addition, the implication was that vis-a-vis -vis the patriarchate, the sublime port would be perceived as having the upper hand in terms of its sense of justice towards its subjects. In other words, while the petitioners excuse me, pointed out the lack of sovereignty of the patriarchate vis-a-vis -vis the sublime port, they also questioned the moral legitimacy of the patriarchate. Bandurts not only represented Van, but they also represented the multiplicity of opposing voices from Van. In each struggle, different groups claimed to represent true, the true voice of the people of Van or Achtamar. In October 1866, a few weeks after the petition against Khachatur was submitted, another petition, again in the name of Achtamar Bandurts, declared that they were not the authors of the petition submitted to the patriarchate in their name. The petitioners found the contents of the former petition almost funny and ridiculous and rejected all the complaints made against Khachatur. Claiming to represent the true voice of the Bandukhs of Ahtamar, they asked the patriarch and the National Assembly to immediately ordain Khachatur as Catholicos. In this petition, they noted that the deputies representing Van in the National Assembly were not self-proclaimed representatives as some had claimed, but they were nominated as representatives not only by the congregation of Achtamar, but by the entire people of Achtamar, Hamaim Jovovuft. This not only shows the voice of the people to be a powerful tool, but the emphasis of the entire people showed that this was something that the authorities in Istanbul would pay attention to and perhaps take the mentioned deputies more seriously. The people's voice evoked in petitions was not part of the standard formulaic phrase, phrases that a scribe would deploy in a petition, as mo most petitions were written by scribes. Rather, the people's voice was a notion that circulated among petitioners. Uh, th this is a picture of Ahtamar, but uh, so the 1866 petition supporting Catholicos uh, Khachatur had 86 uh, signatures. Um, among them, only 14 had titles such as Mahdesi or Haji, uh, which were titles used for those who had paid the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And since only people who had economic means could undertake this pilgrimage, it is also assumed that such men uh, were notable individuals in the community of Van. The other title found among the signatories was Res, uh, which means the head of a village. That the names with the titles were among the minority of the petitions uh, of the petitioners means that the other signatories could possibly have been low level labor migrants. The paleography of the petition stands out uh, in comparison to other uh, petitions, handwritten petitions uh, that I've studied. Uh, here on the left uh, is the 1860, um, or on, on my left at least, is the 1866 petition um, uh, that I discussed. And on the right um, is more of the type of handwriting that one would see in, in petitions. Um, So, and, and the difference is that the letters in a word often stand alone without the usual connection to their adjacent letter, which would be expected in, in Ar Armenian handwritings. Furthermore, the petition lacks any punctuation and contains 
a number of spelling mistakes. These components of the letter indicate that it was not written by a professional scribe, which in turn shows that the petitioners lacked access to or could not afford a professional scribe. While the handwriting, grammar, and vocabulary vary among petitions of Bandurts, the insistence uh, on imposing the wishes, therefore the voice of the majority of Akhtamar or Van people, remain a constant. The conflict surrounding the Catholicos of Khachatur ensued for years. Uh, in 1871, again, members of the Akhtamar uh, jurisdiction who were in Constantinople, in other words, Bandurts, uh, submitted a petition asking for the empty seat of the Catholicos uh, to be filled. In particular, this petition, this petition referred to the demand of the people of the diocese. Uh, of Van, uh, and asks for the seat of Akhtamar to be returned to Khachatur, as the petitioners claimed that this was their right by law. As in, and it is interesting that the petitioners do not appeal to the mercy of the authority, be it the patriarchate or the members of the National Assembly, which is known to usually have been the case uh, um, in, in, in earlier petitions. Instead, they were appealing to the law and, uh, right, and their rights. This may seem obvious to us in the 21st century, but in the mid 19th century, it reveals the transformations in understanding of power, justice, and politics that were happening in this period. This petition from 1871 had 110 signatories, the majority of which had seals. But again, few of them had titles. And seals were almost like identity cards in this period. They were all laymen and all the names were signed individually as a differing handwriting uh, indicates. Uh, the sheer number of signatures speaks to the strong networks of Bandurt in Constantinople that facilitated the mobilization of people to sign such petitions that the petitioners identified as Akhtamartis rather than Vanetis may have been uh, a way to assert uh, the jurisdiction of Akhtamar as a separate form uh, um, that of the Van prelacy. The new regulations of the Armenian constitution and the centralization uh, policy of the patriarchate in Constantinople were meant to subordinate Akhtamar to the prelacy of Van. That meant, for example, that whereas previously Akhtamar would collect taxes from particular areas under its jurisdiction, now this task would fall under the Van Pelis's jurisdiction. Similarly, according to the new regulations, the prelacy was to have the upper hand in the ratification of marriages about uh, which I spoke earlier. In practice, however, the dominant role of the prelate in the diocese of Van continued to be contested uh, by monasteries uh, and, uh, like Akhtamar, Lim, and Gadutz. Petitions gained additional value as they were written about in the newspapers. Um, uh, through the press, conflicting parties attempted to shape the views of the reading public regarding the truth of the matter, as well as uh, to have a say in what the true voice of the people of Van was. And here I have to note that Van, although far from centers of print, uh, print production, uh, was a primary nod uh, of the circulation of print materials, including newspapers. Vanity submitted petitions to the Patriarchate, and they also wrote letters uh, to various newspapers to direct public opinion regarding the innocence or criminality of Bishop Khachatur, as well as to establish what the Vanetsi people's true will was. In 1865, such a letter was sent to the ed editor of Begasian Terchnik, a monthly uh, periodical that was published in Istanbul. Perhaps due to the shortage of space, the signatures on the letter were not published, uh, but at the bottom of the letter, the word signatures was written to indicate their presence. 
the writers emphasized that uh, as locals of Van, neither they nor anybody from their neighboring cities could attest to any crimes committed by Khachatur. And that in any case, the state's official investigation had shown that Khachatur had nothing to do with the murder. That Begasyan Tarchnik published this letter indicates that the editor of the periodical was a supporter of Khachatur's camp. In 1869, the newspaper Masis announced that the Bandukht Vakhtamar had sent a petition to the national administration, uh, Armenian administration opposing Khachatur the self-proclaimed uh, Catholic of Vakhtamar. They asked that the necessary actions be taken to alleviate the suffering of the people. The suffuts over ecclesiastic seats ensued in, in the newspapers. In addition to printed texts, the writings uh, on, uh, on the conflict surrounding the Catholic of Vakhtamar also appeared in print images, as you can see here. Um, in this drawing uh, uh, that appeared in the periodical Pegasian Terchnik, uh, the, the image re represented the conflict between supporters of Bishop Khachatur and supporters of Bishop Hofsep of the Narek uh, monastery over the seat of the Ahtamar Catholic state. Characterizations of the conflict were thus not only directly um, attainable by literate people, but also by the illiterate, uh, who would form an opinion of the conflict through newspaper images. In the image, the tall column represents the seats of the Catholic of Ahtamar, the supporters of uh, Bishop Khachatur, who had claimed the seat of the Catholic of Ahtamar, stand in the left side of the column. The supporters of Abba uh, Hofsep, of the Narek Monastery send, send on the right side of the column. Underneath the image, the dialogue among the supporters of Abbot Hofset uh, is mostly in Kurdish, indicating not only Kurdish language being a prominent one in Van among Armenians, but also the involvement of Kurds in this uh, ecclesiastic conflict. The 1864 murder of Petros, Catholic of Vahtamar, had been blamed on Kurds. But the question was whether the implicated Kurds had carried out the murder independently or on behalf of Khachatur. Some asserted that Khachatur was directly implicated in the murder and blamed him for having close ties with Kurds. In this image, however, it is those opposed to Khachatur and the supporters of Abu Hofsep of Narek uh, Monastery who were represented as Kurdish speakers, perhaps in an attempt to absolve Khachatur of his ties with Kurds. These distinctions are also revealed through their clothes and body language. In this case, the clothing of the supporters of Bishop Khachatur seemed to indicate uh, that they were largely notables, while the clo clothing of the supporters of Bishop Hofsep characterized them as commoners perhaps even peasants, since they were wearing baggy pants. In the image, supporters of Khachatur are standing calmly and absorbing uh, the commotion that the supporters of Abu Hofsep uh, uh, are creating by pulling on the strings attached to the column, which implied that they were trying to take over the seat of Ahtamar. The author indicated that the supporters of Hofsep had put themselves in an embarrassing situation by preventing Khachatur from becoming Catholicos. At the same time, uh, the author implies that if he were the, uh, the only one to see and understand this drawing, it would be all the more cause for embarrassment, uh, meaning perhaps um, for the nation. It seems that his hope was that others would also look at the drawing and change their minds about the conflict. In such an instance, the author concludes the drawing will have been of some use. This conflict surrounding the Catholicos of Khachatur was a conflict among many in Van. There were conflicts around the Pilate Boros Melikian in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, 
in which Banatsi Banduks were involved as well. Starting in the 1840s, the seat of the Catholicos of Achtamar had become a contentious matter uh, because the Patriarchate intended to weaken the power of that seat, while some local groups in Van intended to maintain the legitimacy of that seat and its position within the hierarchy of the Armenian church. While the matter of electing or appointing a bishop uh, to an ecclesiastic position were among the most prominent political issues that Bandukhs would get involved in, there were other issues as well. Bandukhs would sometimes support the opening of a school in Van. They would raise money for such activities uh, and they would complain to the Patriarchate when their efforts would be uh, inhibited in Van by local notables or ecclesiastics. At the same time, ecclesiastics and notables in Van had also become rather aware of the power of Bandukhs in Istanbul and turned to use them as, political, uh, as a political card to force their wishes on the Constantinople Armenian Patriarchate, National Assembly, or the Sublime Port. Thus, when having to make a decision regarding, for example, the Catholicos of Achtamar, which would be unfavorable to the Patriarchate's wishes, the prelate in Van would say that he doesn't have much of a choice because the people of Achtamar had become had come protesting in front of the Armenian palace in Van, and the Bandukhs in Istanbul are threatening to rise in protest. And in order to avoid any sort of commotion, the prelate had to appease to the will will of the people. Another case from 1866 relates to the congregation of the Varag Monastery, which, as you might know, is a monastery right outside the city of Van, overlooking uh, the city. The congregation members of Varag wrote to Magardich uh, Kharimyan, who was in Constantinople. They complained that the local authorities had cut their water supply. The Varag congregation at this time did not have good relations with the local Ottoman uh, government or the local Ottoman Pasha. Uh, they did not bother to give the letter uh, that the Patriarchate had written to the Pasha regarding the issue of water because they were convinced that it would not make a difference. Instead, they hoped to get a decree from the Sublime Port directed to the Pasha of Van through the help of Aga Sarkis, Sergoyan, a notable from Garin, Erzurum, who had good relations with the governor of Erzurum. For their plan to succeed, Varag uh, congregation members thought that there had to be some popular pressure in Istanbul. So they gave what they thought was an ingenious suggestion to Kharimian. They proposed that the, he act as, as if the majority of the Vanetsis, who quote, go in the hundreds and the thousands to Constantinople, are ready to complain both to the Patriarchate and the Sublime Port, end of quote. They warned that nobody should think that the Vara congregation had initiated the complaint of the Vanatsi people in Constantinople, because this would harm their uh, relations with the local Pasha and uh, local Ottoman assembly in Van even further. The congregation members instead told Kharimian to act as if he had managed to appease the Vanatsis in Constantinople and ensured peace. The Vara congregation members were so desperate that with few qualms, they were directly asking Bishop Kharimian to lie. As they noted, having their water cut off for 25 days meant that they were losing anywhere from 500 to 12,000 Hurush of agricultural production. What is important for our purposes in this communication is the recognition of the ecclesiastics in Varag of the power uh, of the large number of vanities in Constantinople, who in their unity could raise substantial commotion and pressure both for the Patriarchate and Sublime Port. Yet they also realized that if they were found responsible for raising havoc in Constantinople, their situation in Van could become even more precarious than it already was. While most Bandukhs were poor and indigent, 
despite their poverty, they were not cut off from the world of politics. Bandos collectively became engaged in the politics of Van through their presence in the Ottoman capital. Their large numbers turned them into a political force. The networks of Bandukhs were not just made up of labor migrants, but included merchants, notable ecclesiastic students, as I mentioned. This means that the labor migrants could also be mobilized through these more powerful members of society. The political engagement of Bandukhs manifested itself, particularly when I pieced together the fragments of evidence about their collect collective voices in petitions, private letters, memoirs, novels, and newspapers. Bandukhts and Bandukhtutum became both a means to make voices from Van audible in Istanbul and a site to which Van Armenians were re represented as destitute uh, and passive provincials rather than engaged his historical actors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dedarian, very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, at this time, we're going to uh, give you an opportunity, our, our participants, our guests, to uh, ask questions. And you can use the uh, chat chat function uh, to ask the questions. And, and I will be uh, answering or asking them to our, our, our guest. While you're doing that, um, I, I have a couple of questions myself or one question myself to maybe start off things. Um, what was the typical length of time that a Bantukht would stay in the capital city? Uh, and would it be a year, two years? Uh, were they sending money back? And then what would prompt mm -hmm. them to return? Yeah, no, actually they, they would, um, that's a very good question. It could be anywhere from 10 to 20 years. So they would be in Istanbul for, for a very, very long time. Uh, because it was not as cheap to travel back and forth. Uh, and sometimes uh, they would send money, but sometimes uh, yeah, another interesting aspect that I found in the petitions that often there are um, priests in Van who are complaining on behalf of, of an abandoned wife in, in Van uh, or of an abandoned family because uh, the husband left uh, as a bandurt but has not uh, sent any monetary help or, or um, communication. Um, so uh, they could be gone for a very long time, um, especially if they were working as uh, in menial jobs, like being a hamal, uh, a porter. Okay, Thank so uh, we have a question. Uh, would you be able to talk more about the connection between the Bantus and the opening of schools in Vaughan? Uh, have mm -hmm. you seen ev evidence that Bantus uh, who learned how to read and write in the capital played a part in spreading literacy in Van once they returned? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question too, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned in my talk, there, there were a number of cases where the Bandukhs raised uh, money and sent it back uh, to Van for the very purpose of opening a school. Um, I have come across a couple of cases when um, uh, when there are Armenians who would go study in Van, right, uh, in in Istanbul, excuse me, uh, uh, and then come back to Van and uh, uh, and continue to work as teachers. Uh, now, again, we have to be careful. In that case, they're not necessarily going to Van as labor migrants, uh, but perhaps they went as students from the beginning, uh, and then we turned back and, and continued um, uh, to teach uh, to their own community in Van. Uh, Kherimyan himself uh, can be seen as one of these people uh, who for a few years came back uh, um, from Istanbul to Van, uh, opened uh, a school in the Varak monastery, as well as a, a printer uh, a, um, in the Varak monastery. Um, so, so there was this, um, the, the, there was, uh, let's say, educational opportunities that were being expanded also through uh, the back and forth of, of migrants of, of different occupations. Yeah. Okay, we have a, another question. Uh, could you uh, tell us some of the other regions or villages that sent large numbers of migrants to Istanbul? Some of the other very well represented areas. <clears throat> 
Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I I know this logic from secondary literature, but Mush uh, obviously was a very um, a prominent place from where labor migrants ended up um, in Istanbul. Um, I think to um, I think depending on the time period that we're talking about, we would uh, have uh, migrants from different regions. But but it, I think it's fair to say that Van and Mush were uh, the regions that sent uh, labor, the largest numbers of labor migrants to Istanbul. It's also important to mention that Istanbul was not the only uh, destination for labor migrants from Eastern provinces. Um, so I think uh, Aleppo was another place where uh, migrants would go from the Eastern provinces uh, to work. Uh, some Armenians uh, from Van would go to the Russian empire to work. Um, so there were different uh, uh, metropolitan uh, areas that uh, Armenians would go looking for work other than Istanbul as well. Okay. Uh, we'll wait for if there's any more questions. Go ahead and write. Now, here comes another question. Uh, uh, someone is curious, were your parents from Vaughn? No. Uh, <laughs> and, Not my uh, grandparents, so yeah. Yeah. So this uh, uh, this question was because their parents, the questioner's parents, were both from Aikistan and Vaughn, and so they mm -hmm. were found your lecture quite enlightening. Um, you outlined in your in your lecture that the uh, the Bantus wrote many petitions regarding the ecclesiastical questions, but did they write many regarding uh, other questions of social injustice or overtaxation as well, or was it just mostly in the on the ecclesiastical area? Um, the petitions that I had access to uh, had a lot to do with ecclesiasticals. Um, there were some, as, as I just mentioned, also having to do with um, family issues where uh, a, 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 a migrant had left a family behind and uh, the family needed to be needed some kind of monetary support. Or there was an issue of uh, the, the woman who had been abandoned wanting to, to marry somebody else. Uh, and the, as there was no divorce at the time, uh, legally speaking in the Armenian church, uh, this created a lot of complications. Uh, but the local priests were, were in Van were all, often for marrying the woman who had been abandoned to avoid, um, uh, they were scared that they would be kidnapped by, uh, by local Muslims or, um, or fall into prostitution uh, and, and things like that. Uh, there were there were other uh, issues like um, um, corruption issues, uh, but they were they were also related to churches um, uh, and um, or or some 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 individuals being um, robbed of their money and, and things like that. Uh, but while I say that, I have to mention that uh, the the. The collection of petitions that I've worked with largely come from the Mubar Library in Paris, uh, which uh, contains part of uh, the collection of the Armenian Patriarchate archives. Uh, and it's important to emphasize that it's a selection of the archives of the Patriarchate. Um, I have also consulted petitions that I found in the Echmiazin uh, Catholic State Archive. Uh, and, and some other uh, archives, uh, but but I uh, I found the majority of the petitions in the uh, uh, in the Nubar Library. Uh, but again, there were a selection, and it's very likely that they chose to focus on on these ecclesiastic chose to select petitions that largely focus on these ecclesiastic matters. Um, and, and in regards to taxation, very likely uh, one could find such petitions in, in Ottoman archives as well. And, and Armenians, uh, I've, I found a number of petitions uh, in, in the Ottoman archives submitted by Armenians of Bonn uh, regarding a variety of issues. Well, thank you, Dr. Zerdarian. We really appreciate your fascinating uh, look into a very uh, little studied or understudied area of uh, Armenian historiography and history. So we want to thank you for the presentation and remind our listeners that uh, this uh, it will be archived on uh, YouTube so that you can uh, 
I'll go back and uh, take a look at it. And if you're interested, uh, you can send me an email if you want to get that access. So uh, I'd like to, uh, again, thank you and tell thank our you. audience again. Yes, thank you. And uh, yeah. that our next uh, event will be next Saturday, uh, March the uh, 27th at 10 o'clock in the morning when Dr. Khachik Muradian will be giving a talk on his new, new book. Thank you and good evening. Uh, and we'll see all of you. Thank at